Eichner uh, has been uh, writing on South Africa and issues of democracy and, and citizenship for, for many years now and is a very uh, pr a prominent intellectual in the South African public sphere, which is a very vibrant public sphere. Uh, if you will hear about that today. And uh, Ivor is here uh, with us for the weekend, uh, along with others, Peter Evans and Harsh Munder. We're, we're doing a, a public event tomorrow from 3.30 to 5.30 on the theme is Civil Society in Peril. Uh, we have human rights uh, activists from around the globe uh, coming uh, to Brown to report on the various ways in which civil society activities are being increasingly restricted and constricted by state actions. Um, so there'll be a series of, of talks in the public event uh, uh, tomorrow, and Ivor will be with us through Saturday. So thank you for being here. Thank you for coming to the Africa Initiative. Thanks to uh, Dan Smith for uh, sponsoring this event. And we, we have a full hour and a half, but hopefully we'll leave a chunk of that time for discussion and debate. Thanks, Ivor. Patrick, thank you. Dan, thank you very much for, for arranging this. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be at Brown. I really, and I really enjoy Providence. So. A nice opportunity again. Um, I'm going to talk to a concept which we've been developing, uh, which I'm going to talk about as elite, as a form of elite populism. And I'm going to argue South Africa is an instance of a growing political development, which we can see playing itself out in places like Venezuela and in India, uh, in, in Turkey. I think even there are signs of it even in, in, in the USA. So I want to argue. I want to try and put South Africa in a, in a comparative perspective. And I want to, want to suggest is that essentially we have to understand the developments in South Africa, which I'll explain to you, discuss with you, in terms of a political phenomenon. Um, so this is where I think the work which I've been doing, especially in South Africa, is regarded as is, is theoretically and politically very controversial, but I stand by the argument, and that's what I want to flesh out and present to you here. Perhaps in the US it, it won't be so controversial. So over the last 10 years, uh, South Africa has seen a situation of what one might call quite serious deterioration in its, in its institutional environment and certainly with regard to its democracy. And we can, we can, date, we can date that periodization uh, at some length. Um, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to, I'm going to pin things around, the, around 2007, which is, a, which is the moment of the National Congress of the, of the ANC, where they elect a new, a new president. It was held in a, a provincial town in the north of the country in a province called Lipopo, called Polokwane, and on the 57th, 52nd Annual National Conference of the ANC, there was an extraordinary, extraordinary development. The incumbent, uh, uh, incumbent president lost his opportunity to, to become president again as a third term, and a new man is elected, Jacob Zuma, becomes president in a moment that was widely regarded as a massive revolt within the African National Congress, and I'll talk about it. What unfolds after that, which is what I want to spend some time discussing, is a period which is increasingly associated with the, with the notion of, of state capture. Essentially, this idea being that a morally compromised president in the form, of, in the, in the form of, of Jacob Zuma, his family and a coterie of political allies around him have insinuated themselves into the fabric of South Africa's administration and state and used it essentially to, for their own private gain. So a process of massive looting and, and, and generally a corruption. And this is the sense, this is the growing narrative about South Africa, increasingly reported in, on those terms in South Africa, but also around the world. Um, interestingly enough, I saw that the New York Times ran a big feature on South Africa, and Australia, that wasn't actually the narrative. It was more a sense of growing inequality. But I think the sense of the growing inequality in South Africa is a profound crisis and failure of the ruling party to manage the economy in a way that sustains socially just, uh, socially just practices. At the core of this argument, though, is an argument around corruption. Essentially, uh, what we're dealing with in South Africa is a phenomenon of, of corruption. And the, the politics that follows from it is a sense of, is a, is a kind of a law and order response. What is required, what is needed, is for Jacob Zuma and the people around him to be arrested, tried, and hopefully convicted. And this is the sense that this is what is going to redeem South Africa uh, from its, 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 its current course. So I think that I, I am sympathetic to some of those arguments. I'm sympathetic to the idea that criminals should be, should be caught and prosecuted and jailed. But I think that that analysis, this fixation with corruption, both in South Africa and generally, obscures what I think is a profound political dynamic, um, which, we need to, which we need to understand and develop a response to. 
So I'm calling it I'm calling it a form of elite populism. And here I'm drawing, if you like, on the work of Partha Chatterjee, but I'm in, in a critical manner, to get it to begin to understand it. So Chatterjee in the in his more recent work, and you'll be very familiar with this, that distinction which he, which he draws from, from Gramsci between political society and, and civil society. And his essential argument is that in where the vast majority of the world's population live in the former colonial world, the rules of civil society of the state are written in such a way that they are rigged to exclude ordinary, ordinary working people and, 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 and the figure of, figure of the subaltern. And under those circumstances, uh, the subaltern, ordinary poor people, have no option but to uh, play hard and fast with the rules, uh, slide through them, break them, subvert them, and in some cases even revert to, even revert to violence as a legitimate form of a legitimate response to, 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 to that current situation. So in Patagee's terms, we have a world which is very different to, say, the world of... Um, of, of, of the associated with the concept of, of exit and voice, for example, um, um, uh, uh, a conception of the politics in the third world, the politics in the developing world, which produces uh, violence and, 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 and subversion as, as its normal practice. So I think there's a growing anthropology, ethnographic studies, which suggest that Chatterjee's work is f quite flawed in all sorts of empirical senses. I know the work of Carlos Forment, for example, in Argentina, and there's some very interesting um, 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 Indian anthropologists exploring those conceptions, and I, the sense being that, that Patagee's conception is very, very empirically uh, narrow, um, and that there are other, 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 other dynamics of the poor going on, other politics of the poor going on. What I think is so interesting, though, is that those, that conception has been in many cases, and South Africa is a typical example, and this is what I want to show you, has been appropriated by political elites making their own claims on the state and are using this discourse of Chatterjee's to justify, in sometimes in good faith, a politics which sets themselves up against the law and the constitution. In other words, it's political elites that are appropriating the subaltern politics to uh, confront, to break, and to violate, to violate the constitution. So this is the this is the story I want to tell you about South Africa. And I think so. This is, I think this places the South African phenomenon in in, in, in the space of a populist politics which is unfolding in, in many locations. So let me let me let me let me start with where I think we should start. Um, and you can ask me questions for those of you about or familiar with South Africa about whether my periodization is right. Some of questions in relationship to earlier phases of corruption, especially around the arms deal, and I will justify my my my, my periodization. So, as I mentioned, 2007, there is a revolt within the African National Congress. It takes place in this provincial town in a, in a, in a northern province called Limpopo. It's associated with the removal of, 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 the, of, of Thabo Beki as president of the ANC, and a few days later he's removed as president of the country. That the ANC call, or asks him to step down. Uh, Jacob Zuma becomes president of the ANC, and then the following election in 2009, um, he becomes president of the country. Now, what is so interesting about the Polokwane moment, I think it's associated with a pr moment of profound critique. Uh, uh, it's not just a spasmodic rejection of, of a certain politics. I think there's a a very earnest and a very important critique which, 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 uh, which follows from Polokwane, that it's associated with quite a devastating critique of South Africa's political economy as it was unfolding during the Mandela and Antabo Mbeki years. Essentially, the critique goes something like this. What you had under Mandela, and especially under, uh, under Antabo Mbeki, was, was relatively fast economic growth by, by for at least 30, 40 years. We had 3.5, almost 5% economic growth. But it's associated with certain pathologies. One is the emergence of a small uh, non-racial elite, um, a very, very um, a vulnerable black middle class, heavily, heavily indebted, and we can discuss that, who have come and who have entered the middle class through access to government jobs, access to jobs in the private sector, but also through, but are massively indebted. And then for the vast majority of South Africans, black South Africans, massive economic exclusion. Essentially, what's happened is the economy has grown in such a way that if you're English-speaking and that if you're in the cities or you're English-speaking and you speak English without an accent, there are opportunities for you if you're formally educated. But for the rest of South Africans, especially black South Africans, in rural areas, in informal settlements, massive, massive political exclusion. So I think Polokwane is associated with a very profound, correct critique of that, of that political economy and the trajectory of, of the way South Africa is growing. 
And what there is beginning from Polokwane is the search for, in the language which is popular in South Africa, for more radical models of economic transformation. The sense that this idea of, of economic transformation, which has informed the, the Taibo Beki years, is fundamentally flawed and is a, a search for something else. The Taibo Beki years are associated, if you like, with two major policy instruments. One is through what's called black economic empowerment, which is encouraging, cajoling, incentivizing uh, white owned firms. We can discuss that term later if you want. Uh, to essentially to give up equity in, in, in equity in the form of shares in the, in the, in the company and, and transfer some large substantial portions of equity to, to black shareholders. Black uh, affirmative action measures are, are put in place to try and push change control patterns within South African corporates by encouraging, by bringing uh, black management, uh, by encouraging uh, firms to bring manager, blacks into, into senior management positions. The sense is that this, this model has produced the, 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 the situation I've described, but basically is a failure. So from 2007, 2008, you start seeing a whole host of sort of different conceptions of what radical transformation look like. Uh, some of them are familiar. Um, Julius Malema, a character you may well be familiar with, he's now the, uh, the leader of what's called Economic Freedom Fighters, Freedom Fighters in South Africa. At the time, he's the head of the ANC Youth League. And he rejects the Taiwan Beki policies and he returns back to the principles of the Freedom Charter, which essentially returned to kind of 1950 socialism about nationalizing the commanding heights of the uh, nationalizing the commanding heights of the economy, nationalizing uh, land, etc. And that becomes the political platform of the EFF when it eventually splits from from the ANC. But that's not the only model of economic transformation which is in circulation. More 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 powerful is one that emerges on the margins of the ANC, but especially within government, and in particular the Department of Trade and Industry. Also heavily influenced by organized black business in the form of the Black Management Forum. And they're looking at models of economic transformation, and they're especially impressed with, I think, a, a naive, a certain mytho mythological conception of uh, Afrikaner economic empowerment from an, from an earlier period. And here the idea is that the, we can no longer uh, rely on cajoling white business or the existing capitalist economy to transform itself. Rather, the project is to create an entirely new economy, black-owned, black-controlled, new industrial economy. How to do it? From about 2010, 2011, we start seeing a whole round of position papers emerging from the Department of Trade and Industry and other parts of government. It starts in the, it's the, it's the first ideas emerge in the department, a new Department of Economic Affairs called Economic, Department of Economic Development, although they don't like to be called DEB, they prefer to be called EDD, <laughs> uh, for obvious <laughs> reasons. Um, uh, this idea of using public procurement to produce a new kind of economy. From around 2010, 2011, we start seeing tremendous excitement around the idea of using the procurement budgets of state-owned enterprises, state-owned companies, to displace existing established white firms from their position in the economy and create new incentivize the emergence of new large-scale industrial black-owned black control firms you can see this tremendous excitement around this idea the ideas are compelling uh, he has an idea of economic transformation which is not about reforming an existing economy but it creates a whole new black-owned black controlled industrial economy there's tremendous excitement around this idea the central player in this regard is our current minister of finance his name is Manusi Gigaba and at the time he, well, sh shortly after t 2011, he becomes the Minister of Public Enterprises, responsible for the state of enterprises. There's a document we find from 2011. You can almost see the, the writers are, are, are salivating. There's a list of all the state of enterprises in South Africa, and they come up with a figure of 200 and bi 210 billion rand per annum, which is potentially available in procurement budgets to undertake this kind of economic transformation. Two in particular uh, make up the lion's share of these, of, 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 of these potential funds, and that is Transnet, which is the state-owned enterprise which owns and controls the, the freight railway system, and freight rail system network in South Africa. And the other is ESCOM, which is the state-owned company which is responsible for, it's a state monopoly, which, which generates electricity and transmits electricity nationally. And within these two companies alone, there's in the tens of billions of rounds available for each year for, for this project. The project starts off quite early. Um, I mentioned Minister Gabo becomes the Minister of Public Enterprises, and you see a shuffling of the boards of the State of Enterprises. A guy called Brian Malefi, the video I have is of Brian Malefi speaking in January this year. 
he becomes the, the, the CEO of, of, of Transnet, and immediately you start seeing the commissioning of huge new industrial projects. So Transnet immediately embarks on a huge project of acquiring, in rand terms, it's a lot of money, in dollar terms, I don't know, 50 billion rands worth of, of, of new trains. He then moves, to, moves, moves over to ESCOM, and it's the same thing. Huge new, huge new projects, especially around, around coal and building of new power stations. Now, what is so interesting, and this is where I think that it takes an unexpected turn. Around 2011, the project of radical economic transformation itself radicalizes, and it radicalizes in an unexpected way. I don't think this reading, is this, 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 what, what follows, was necessary. And I think it emerges from a particular political conjuncture inf informed by lo particular local conditions, but also drawing from an international political vocabulary. From around 2011, the project of radical economic transformation radicalizes in a very interesting way. The argument emerges that the constitutional framework in South Africa is an obstacle to radical transformation itself that the, on the South African constitution and the transition itself, the political settlement that produced the opening the end of apartheid, is the, is, is the result of what's called in South Africa an elite pact, um, uh, that it is fundamentally hostile to, 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 to black South Africans and to poor black South Africans in particular, through, for example, the protection of property rights. And what you <coughs> increasingly see emerging is an argument that places the Constitution and the bodies that, that the Constitution gives <coughs> rise to as fundamental obstacles to, to economic transformation. And what I think it does is it sets off in South Africa a politics which starts, which starts moving against those institutions. There are also some very particular reasons. The South African Constitution, is, I think, is unusual in several respects. The first is that the National Treasury in South Africa, the National Treasury is a little bit like the US Treasury, except it doesn't, it's not responsible, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't print money. I think the US Treasury prints, prints money, that's the responsibility of the Reserve Bank. But it, it, oversees all it, all, it's, it oversees all spending in South Africa and it allocates budgets to departments. So it, its mandate is, a, is given by the Constitution. In other words, its mandate is not set by government, it is not set by legislation, it's given by the Constitution. More surprisingly, and I haven't seen this in other constitutions, Public procurement in South Africa is a constitutional matter, section 217 of the constitution. So the way in which government spends, buys, and s buys goods and services is given, the terms of it are given by the constitution. And the South African constitution requires that two principles are reconciled. The first is what we might call a principle of fair value. It says that the government must procure goods and services on the basis of price on the basis of the expertise or the experience of the service provider. In other words, on the basis that the, the, the value and the, the citizen and the fiscalists are going to get value for money. And the second is the principle of, of black economic empowerment, of equity, that uh, black economic, that black owned and controlled companies should be privileged or given preference in, in procurement matters. So the constitution assumes that these two principles can easily be reconciled. Perhaps not easily reconciled, but nonetheless are, are reconcilable. They're, they're not in fundamental contradiction. From 2011, you start seeing from within the Black Management Forum, but especially within the Department of Trade and Industry and in parts of the ANC, an argument begins to emerge that these principles are not only can they not be reconciled, but actually they're in fundamental contradiction. If government procures goods on the basis of, 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 of fair value, it will always prejudice black-owned firms, it will always advantage established white companies that have great experience in the market and that have, and that have, established, and that, that have established supply chains. What you start seeing, therefore, is that government, parts of, parts of government and parts of the Black Management Forum, parts of the ANC, are pushing very, very strongly for a clause to be, uh, a new principle of preferential procurement to be introduced, which would, rather technically, set aside 30% of all public procurement going to black-owned firms irrespective of price and irrespective of experience. It's National Treasury that has to implement those regulations and we see in that period incredible contestation around National Treasury to, 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 to introduce those measures. The problem is that the measure would run against the Constitution. Uh, and what you start seeing in the form of, of Pravin Gordon, who's the Minister of Finance at the time, he balks. He won't do it. He, uh, he plays some games, he, he introduces the regulation, and then he does something extraordinary. 
he exempts all state en enterprises from that from, from that regulation. And I think what it's doing within within this, the Jacob Zuma administration, which is pushing very strongly for this within parts of the Black Management Forum, within other parts of government, is a growing opposition to what is regarded as the conservatism of of of, um, of the national treasury. So you start seeing an extraordinary politics emerging from the, from around 2011, 2012 of attacks, growing attacks on, 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 on the National Treasury, growing pressure to, to remove the Minister of Finance. Eventually it comes to a head in, in December 2015 when the Minister of Finance is, in fact, then is fired, a, a backbencher is brought into, his, into the position and it sets off, it triggers a whole uh, beginnings of, of, of the downgrading of South Africa on international markets. And, 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 the, and the weakening of the round and, and South Africa's economy is, 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 is perhaps not in tailspin, but it's, it, it, it's certainly struggling. What is interesting, though, is that, as I say, I think parts of government, uh, especially within the Jacob Zuma administration, come to the conclusion that they cannot prosecute radical economic transformation within the framework within the Constitution. And what you start seeing, therefore, is a growing move to illegality, a growing space of illegality happening within government, but it's politically sanctioned. I don't believe that it's just about self-enrichment or, or on corruption. I think it's part of this, a, a sense that the Constitution is an obstacle. And you start seeing it dramatically happening within the state of the enterprises, within Transnet and within, within ESCOM. There are so many stories. South Africa at the moment, well over the last year, has been a place of one dramatic scandal week after week. We have a remarkably, we still have a remarkably free press. Uh, we still have parts of the press which, have, which are made up of incredibly courageous investigative journalists. Many of them are um, associated with a network called Amabungani of, of, of independent investigative journalists. And they've been breaking week after week the most extraordinary stories of what is called in South Africa large-scale corruption. So I'll give, you, give you an I'll give you a typical example. And you can see how it fits into this pattern of, of, of displacing white-owned firms and bringing in new, new, um, new, 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 new companies. Uh, ESCOM is, uh, generates electricity overwhelmingly through coal. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's been, it's been quite hostile to the renewables program in South Africa, which has not been unsuccessful. Uh, from 20, 2008, there's a massive build pro project in South Africa to establish new uh, coal-fired coal power stations, huge build program. Um, at the center of, of some of the politics, therefore, is the supply of coal to the various ESCOM power stations. Many of these coal contracts are long established coal contracts of, of, of various historically white owned uh, mining companies. One, for example, is owned by a company called Glencore. It's an optimum coal mine, coal mine it's, but it's supplying uh, low quality coal to some of the ESCOM power stations. Um, it's been hedging the price of, its, of, the, of, the, of the sale of its local coal on the basis of international markets. It sells the better stuff on the international markets. The international market in coal declines. It throws the coal mine into, into economic crisis. And the coal mine appeals to ESCOM to renegotiate the price of its coal. ESCOM absolutely refuses. Absolutely refuses. And ESCOM, under Brian Molefe, drives optimum coal mine to, into bankruptcy. Uh, it's forced, to, it, it forced into bankruptcy. It then, in circumstances which are so outrageously illegal, it's almost, it's almost incredible, it essentially loans the money to a, a, a politically connected family, the Guptas, to buy the optimum coal mine, uh, in circumstances which we're now beginning to, to understand. But what is extraordinary is what happens to the price of that same coal. We know this, we know this contract, but there are lots of these sorts of contracts, to give you an idea. The contract historically with with Optimum Coal Mine was for, for was for three was worth 325 million rand an annum per annum for that for the sale of its coal. For the same part of low quality coal, the value of the contract goes from 325 million rand per annum to seven billion rand per annum. So massive, massive rents are being charged on on, on, on these goods. When I when I presented the betrayal report to the Southern Communist Party uh, to its annual congress, there was. Uh, I mean, they'd invited me there, so they were, they, were, they, were, they were curious to hear. There was complete stunned silence, because what it's doing is it's massively driving up, drive, driving up coal prices. So this is the situation which, which is happening uh, within, within the state and enterprise and within government. But it's also having dramatic consequences within the rest of the state. 
So as, you, as this project moves, moves to a space of illegality, and increasingly to in, in, at the space of illegality is creating opportunities for all sorts of criminality to happen, there's a growing criminal, like, criminalization of the state. So there are moves against other parts of the South African state, in particular those parts which have capacity, investigative, criminal investigative capacity and prosecutorial capacity. The first to go is the South African Revenue Services, which we can discuss is one of the great, remarkable stories of post-apartheid South African ANC government, build an incredibly effective uh, um, agency that, uh, that collects taxation in South Africa, really one of the great, great heroic stories of post-apartheid South Africa. Uh, by, the, by 2014, the South African Revenue Services is not just, not just collecting taxation, it's also built up quite a formidable capacity to go after errant or non-compliant or non taxpayer, non uh, taxpayers, um, many of whom are increasingly politically connected. Uh, it's got a very, very effective unit that goes after them. In to the end of 20, 2014, there's a purge at SARS. Its entire leadership are removed under the most extraordinary circumstances. And um, a, a, a new leadership is brought in, which is politically aligned to, to, to Jacob Zuma. I'll tell you a little about the circumstances, because it gives you a pattern of the increasing securitization of the South African state and the role of the intelligence agencies in the way in which South Africa works. The story goes like this. A dodgy intelligence dossier emerges in around, uh, around that period, 2014, alleging that there is a conspiracy by uh, largely a, a Indian leadership within SARS to discriminate and exclude black Africans from the organization. Uh, there are claims that the, the organization is acting illegally by spying on, on, on the president and doing all sorts of extraordinary things like running a brothel, quite amazing things. The dossier is in circulation. Uh, it's in circulation. Uh, eventually it lands at the large, large circulation Sunday newspaper in South Africa called the Sunday Times. Its uh, editor, for reasons which I'm not quite sure why, she publishes the story. Um, and she week after week she's publishing these, rogue, these claims of a rogue unit within SARS. Um, the stories are complete rubbish, complete, complete and utter rubbish, but for week after week after week for a year she's running these stories claiming the most astonishing things, that the SARS unit are spying on the president, they're running broth, they're doing the most amazing, amazing things. The leadership of SARS used that report then to run their own, uh, run their own investigation, um, KPMG are brought in, KPMG, a large uh, uh, international audit firm, do an investigation, uh, they confirm the story of a rogue unit and it's used as an alias to fire the entire leadership of SARS. It later emerges, of course, which we knew at the time, the stories are completely bogus, utterly bogus, they have no substance whatsoever. The Sunday Times eventually is forced to retract the story. KPMG is now in enormous, enormous trouble for, for writing a report which had absolutely no standing. Um, um, Borders on, borders on illegality, the most extraordinary unprofessionalism. The point is, it's the story of these intelligence dossiers are, are playing themselves out right across the state. So, for example, there's a special, there's a special um, um, elite, uh, elite police unit, a police unit in South Africa called the Hawks, supposed to be investigating high, um, um, high priority crime. We see the exact same thing. Its entire leadership are purged in exactly the same way. An intelligence report emerges claiming that the head of the Hawks in Gauteng, General Sabia, <laughs> is involved in the illegal rendition of Zimbabweans. The idea being that uh, Zimbabweans were sent back to, it is by, in, Southern, in South African law, it's illegal to uh, repatriate people that face a death penalty in their own country. Uh, so uh, Zimbabwean the prisoners are repatriated to Zimbab back to Zimbabwe where they're murdered and it's illegal by South African law, and there's a claim that uh, General Sabia was part of the repatriation. Again, it's nonsense. The other one is General Boysons. He's head of the Hawks in KZN. The claim is that he's been running an illegal hit squad, which has been killing, uh, killing uh, criminals in, 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 in Cape Town Manor and the area of Durban. It's, it's complete rubbish. The same thing with the head of the Hawks nationally. The claim is also he's involved in illegal, illegal stuff. There are all these intelligence dossiers, and they used to remove them. They're all complete nonsense. The NPA, the prosecuting authority as well, is purged in the same way. They remove its leadership, although it has a longer history. So what you start seeing is, as, this, as the general move to illegality and criminality emerges, so government, especially the Zuma administration, starts taking on key other parts of the key state institutions. So there's a general weakening of the state. 
We see something else as well. In the betrayal report, we, we argue that there's the emergence of what we call a shadow state. Essentially, decision-making is shifting increasingly away from constitutional bodies. It's shifting out of government. It's certainly not happening in Parliament. It's not even happening in the ANC into these informal networks which resemble what Jackson and Rothberg might have discussed as networks of personal power. We call them in our report kitchen cabinets. Uh, which are loose affiliations, they're constantly changing in their form and in their character, but loose affiliations are people bound by personal allegiances, uh, perhaps, by, and perhaps uh, shared, shared, uh, shared participation in, 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 ver in, ver in various deals. But what's definitely happening is that power and key decision making is shifting away from the constitutional bodies and away from, the, 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 away from democratic, or democratic organs. So in this sense, what we've argued in South Africa is a growing fragility of, 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 of weakening of, of, of democratic organs, a growing a weakening of, of, of the state itself, and then of course uh, we see that huge amounts of money, huge, uh, Pravin Gordon, the former Minister of Finance, is now talking about a figure of 200 billion, I don't know where he gets it from, it sounds too high to, in my mind, but figures of tens of billions of rands are, are leaving the country, so the project is not developmental as well. In South Africa and more generally, Again, this is analysed fundamentally as a story of, of corruption, of a criminal network that have seized power of the state and are, and are, and are, and are, and are milking institutions for their, for their own gain. I think something much more complicated is going on here. I think there, there, is some, there is some of that, but I definitely think it is informed by a political instinct originally. And the political instinct is this that it is in the name of serving poor people, where the rules of the game have been rigged against poor and ordinary people, it is necessary and legitimate, therefore, to break the rules. I think what you have coming to power after, for, after, after Paul Aquan in 2009 is a government that associates or identifies itself as, as left, wants to identify and has identified itself with ordinary South Africans. Don't forget Jacob Zuma himself is an interesting figure. He's not an educated man. He speaks English with great difficulty. He's not especially numerate. In other words, it's people like him that are essentially discriminated and, 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 and have not benefited from, from growth in South Africa. It's people like him who the new project wants to benefit. Um, and the sense is that the only way of allowing people like that into the economy is to break the rules fundamentally. So I think this is a political instinct, and I think it's what I'm calling it an elite populism. It's a, an, it's a political elite who are reading Fanon, who are reading uh, Chatterjee. They are taking on board those ideas, and they are pursuing them in the name of serving a, 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 a popular agenda. I think you're seeing this sort of politics in India as well. You're seeing, you're seeing it in Venezuela. Uh, you're seeing it in Turkey uh, with, with some differences. I think there, this phenomenon of elite populism, a sense you saw it in Brexit uh, in, in, in the UK, a sense that for ordinary people to get ahead, the existing system, the existing rules of the game need to be fundamentally dislodged or even, even shattered. I think this is the political conviction that is informing the current politics in South Africa. So let me end here. If that analysis is correct, the prospect of democracy both in South Africa, but I think in the, in, in the US, in Turkey, etc., means taking on board this idea, this conviction. It is to, it is to, it is, it, it requires a rallying behind a democratic politics, but not, not, not just discursively, but it needs to demonstrate that a democratic politics, a democratic form, can also have real benefits for ordinary, for poor working people. Because in the current system, there's a, the association with democracy, with an elite politics, is too strong. Uh, being, if you like, democracy itself has been, a cap, has been captured by elites. In order for us to revive the democratic project, both in South Africa, but I think around the world, there needs to be a radicalization of the democratic politics to make real inroads and real concessions to the demands of, 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 of ordinary, poor, and working people. It comes to an end there. Thank you. Thanks, Ivor. You've uh, given, us, uh, given us a lot to think about. Um, I think we'll, is there a format then? And, and just open it up and take, take questions yourself. Um, so you talked a little bit about the radical kind of economic transformation model. Mm -hmm. And I think that, at least from what I've studied, it seems that it's been perpetrate in other countries, like in Zimbabwe with the very controversial land reform project. And I just wanted to know, like, from your perspective, how do you think that 
a people or a state can go about reforming these systems that were created essentially to disenfranchise black people, poor people, indigenous people within these states without seemingly like paralyzing an economy or a political structure. Do you want to take a couple? You can go one at a time for a while because we've got enough time. Okay, I mean, that's, a, it's, that's, that's, that's an enormous question. Um, I don't know. Let me give you an, an uh, let me answer it in a perhaps unexpected way. So I think, there, I'm sure there are a whole lot of economists who will have a whole lot of ideas of, of, of models of the economy, etc. I think that there's a cultural issue at stake here as well, which we don't confront. Uh, we don't confront it in South Africa at all. Uh, I'm not sure we confront it well anywhere. So there's a, there's a, a very, very important essay uh, written by um, guy that used to be head of the policy policy unit in the presidency under Thabo Mbeki, a guy called John Nechatenza. He runs a, a think tank in South Africa now called MISTRA, Martin Luther Institute for Strategic Reflection. Um, the paper is called The Sins of Incumbency. And amongst other things, he argues that what is regarded as a middle class life in South Africa actually is not middle class by any standards anywhere else in the world. That the conception of being middle class in South Africa is a colonial phenomenon. They're produced by a certain a white politics who got a, a white stand, who set a standard of living for themselves, regarded as middle, middle class. But by any else, by any standards in the world, this is how the super rich live: uh, two cars in the garage, a large house uh, with a garden, uh, servants, uh, a swimming pool, uh, uh, an ability to to eat out on a regular basis, uh, holiday at least once a year, maybe maybe twice. That this is regarded as. Uh, a normal middle class, middle class standard of living. And his argument is that that norm was never critiqued or rejected in the, in, in, in the ANC or within the liberation movements, but rather that norm has been internalized broadly within South African society. So when we think of reaching or pursuing a middle class standard of living, this is what people are pursuing. But of course, it's unattainable for other, unattainable for anyone but a, but a handful of people in South Africa, never, never mind the world. And what it does is it produces a political economy which drives people into massive, massive indebtedness. So I would start, I'm sure there are all sorts of, and there are brilliant people in the room here and at this university who would have all sorts of ideas about economic structures and institutions. But I would think that there is a cultural critique which we need to start with, and the sense of what constitutes middle classness, what constitutes a, a, a decent standard of, of, of living in South Africa. There's very interesting work around public servants in, 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 in the post-colonial moment who having a sense of the civil servants, having a sense of their norm of living must be like that of the colonial civil service as well, and a kind of reproduction of, of those conceptions of what it means to, to, to live well. I think Ashin and Bimba is getting to this when he talks about the post-colonial elites drawing on Fanon as kind of zombie-like, in the sense that they're just repeating, uh, without life, without critique, without a sense of reflection, the kinds of the norms and standards of, 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 of the colonial moment. So I think, you know, if you read that Norbert Elias stuff around our civilization and, 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 and what's, the, what's it in English? Um, I don't know, I don't know the English. Um, but the sense of the, the, German, the German bourgeoisie in relationship to the German aristocracy of rejecting fundamentally German aristocratic values and producing a, a new kind of bourgeois norms which are in, re, in relationship to that, that kind of work, that kind of work of decolonization definitely hasn't even started in South Africa. Am I doing the... Yes. Oh, okay. So I, I know some people's names, but not everyone. So really yeah, I, I'd like to continue pursuing this enormous question. Uh, but in a sort of more modest way. And that is, obviously you can't uh, expect to deliver this colonial middle class lifestyle. On the other hand, if the subaltern or the, the, the poor of South Africa are to get on board uh, with a critique of this uh, sort of corrupt version of, of, of radical transformation, you have to be able to present a credible, a credible possibility for 
some delivering of the basic kinds of things that they would like to have. Some education, some health, some affordable housing, uh, etc. And the question is, can you see a way of constructing a program or a paradigm or a policy or whatever that is likely to be credible to those folks who have been through, after all now, 20 years of uh, a lot of promises of exactly that made by well-meaning people, um, uh, etc., and have not, it hasn't happened. It hasn't happened for them despite considerable efforts because uh, it, it does seem to me that, that uh, you have to be able to make that kind of promise in a credible way if you're going to win politically. And what would that kind of promise entail? And would it perhaps entail some elements of this radical economic transformation that has gone so badly awry? So, I mean, I think what's so interesting about South Africa at the moment is that we're not having these discussions. Partly because we're so fixated on, on, on trying to preserve our democracy, stand up for civil servants that are being persecuted in the most astonishing ways. And I'll talk a little bit. I mean, what is, what is exciting is that there is a resurgence of civil society movements in South Africa. There are growing social movements which are taking up these issues. But we are not having the, these sorts of policy debates about, about um, new, kinds of, um, new kinds of economic models. There's a fallback a few years ago. A South Africa development was called the National Development Plan. Uh, actually, went through a very wide consultative process of developing a development vision, and then and then populating that vision with quite concrete proposals. It's a it's a it's a it's a very lengthy, uh, unwieldy document, but it's got some proposals in it, which lay out some kind of social democratic vision, uh, welfare with instruments to which with with instruments to to, to create growth. There's, a, there's, there's lots of lip service to that document. Um, um, and I think in many people there's a sense that it lays the foundation of some sort of, some sort of alternative to the current situation. But um, can, you, can you present a version of that that's credible to the average subaltern that is believable as deliverable? So this, is the, this, is, this is the dilemma. So much of it depends on the ability of state institutions to, 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 to work programmatically. Um, and the kind of hemorrhage, hemorrhaging that I've discussed at the National Treasury, but also within the police, within the, within the revenue services, is happening right across the state. Uh, I don't think it's just a politics of, of, of corruption. I think there are, you know, don't forget, by the end of the apartheid period, most of the 20th century in South Africa, uh, there's been a government in power which is trying to break the country up into separate countries. Uh, by the end of the apartheid period, there are 14. None of them have. None of them are. None of them are independent in, in, in any in, uh, any legitimate manner. But you have 14 territories which have their own administration. Seven of them are, are nominally have been given nominal independence. Uh, countries like places like the Transkei, for example, have been running as effectively uh, independent states for nearly 20 years. They have their own bureaucracies, etc. Thrown together. In, in, in 1994. So very, very complex histories of, of state integration which start from 1994. So there are very great inherent institutional weaknesses in the state, coupled by a politics which has been quite devastating over the last 10 years to, to, to stability and, and, and leadership within those states. So the question of over and above vision, ability of state administrations to deliver on, 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 on mandates is, is very, very highly uneven. Having said that, there have been some extraordinary achievements, uh, enormous achievements. I mean, the establishment of the National Treasury is an enormous achievement. The establishment of South African Revenue Service is an enormous achievement. This ANC does build well over is it, nearly two million houses. I mean, there are extraordinary there are extraordinary achievements amongst all of that institutional weakness. So, I think yes, we need there's a there's a sense of vision, but there's also a need for state building, and this is really the kind of work that I'm involved in. At the back there, yeah. yes. Um, so I think that, you know, I was stimulated, uh, Preeti, by what you said. Uh, your comparison of 
the rise of populism in, in South Africa and India. And I want to say that there are similarities. I mean, there, there, there is a, a rise of, of popular, pop, populist leadership. Uh, also, some of the other similarities from what you spoke about, the leader presenting himself as an outsider to the elite establishment of the past, mm -hmm. somebody who's had a disadvantaged background and is, uh, 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 you know, is, represents, therefore, uh, the uh, disadvantage. Uh, and also the need to change the constitution. I think these are similar. But yet, uh, there's some very profound differences. Uh, because in India, the, the, the constitution is presented not as a barrier to social and economic equality uh, in the way that you described in South Africa, but really to advance uh, a resolution of the, of the majority community, the Hindu community, feeling that it needs to get its due in a country where it is in its majority. So uh, it's, it's for a very different reason that the constitution needs to be changed. But the question that I wanted to present was, although there are these differences and there are these similarities, perhaps what we are witnessing across the world is, is actually the outcome in the end of the crisis of neoliberal capitalism uh, to produce jobs and to produce decent work uh, to present uh, sustainable, you know, uh, a sustainable, credible alternative to large masses of young people from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds with their aspirations for, for, for a better life. And it is this crisis that is manifesting itself in different ways in different countries. But in the end, we have to address the fact that this pattern of economic growth cannot deliver uh, jobs in a good life for millions of our young people and and therefore we are having populist leaders presenting themselves in different formats so what do you mm. how would you suggest uh, how would you react to that look i mean i think i think you put your finger on on on, on some profound dynamics um in south africa it's you know, there's been a lot of critique of the ANC as, a, as, as neoliberal and as having dropped off the whole range of neoliberal policies. I'm, uh, I would want us to be a little bit careful around, around that, 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 that analysis because it, it tends towards caricature. Uh, so for example, national treasury in South Africa is often dismissed and, 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 and is a way of legitimizing a, uh, the, the, the attack on it as it's, a, it's the vanguard of, of neoliberalism in South Africa, vanguard of austerity, I think this is myth-making. Uh, what you definitely see is a extraordinarily, from the point of view of the budget, a redistributive fiscus. So massive, massive movement of, 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 of state resources into, into social development and into massive, but massive. So we go from a situation, massive increases to, to social grants, to pensions, so I think the latest figures are 17 million people of in South 17 million people in South Africa, a population of 50 million, are on are, are on some form of welfare. Uh, huge increases, uh, but uh, social um, municipal services are overwhelmingly subsidised for the for the poor, electricity, water. Um, so a huge redistributive redistributive uh, fiscus. Um, there are. So the, so the question of neoliberalism, I, I think under Mbeki, I think that, that critique is, is, is correct to some extent. I think what you're also dealing with, though, is the profound legacy of the apartheid political economy. And there's a fantastic, there was a, a very, I think, very, very important Marxist scholar um, in South Africa, Martin Legasic, and he writes, a, he writes an article for the 1970s, which, extra, which is extraordinarily prescient. And he basically anticipates, this is the 1970s, he anticipates that the big major problem of post-apartheid South Africa is going to be unemployment. And his argument is essentially, which I think is absolutely correct, that South African, capital, South African capitalism develops in such a way that essentially it bifurcates the economy into two zones, a colonial zone and a metropolitan zone. And in the metropolitan zone, uh, companies are, are, are designed to employ as few people as possible without black, not needing black labor. So there's a huge move to, um, to uh, capital, uh, to uh, the use of technology in production. Manual production is happening in the colonial territories and in the Bantustans and the reserves. The colonial economy is a failure. Those areas are, require huge subsidization. Most of those economies are closed down in the post-apartheid period, leaving an economy which largely is not dependent on labor, uh, large parts of the economy. 
So you have a structural constraint in the South African economy that even when it grows, it produces particular kinds of jobs, uh, high-skilled jobs requiring a uh, formal education, uh, at least at secondary level. It grows in such a way that it produces jobs which, for which most South Africans can't, can't, can't participate in. So there's an element of neoliberalism, but I also think there are these very large, very substantive uh, structural constraints of, 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 of employment in the South African economy. And no, per, no government, no one has dared or known how to begin to tackle that. And that seems to be the major economic challenge in South Africa going forward. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I have two questions. First is, uh, so you said, you said that there's been a political project involved behind this about the necessity for economic transformation. So has this led to any redistributive policies, anything new? Has have they used this polit new political leverage to do anything economically new? Second is that, so you said it, you're, you're not having these policy discussions about what is to have, have to happen next. But it seems like there's a lot of conversation about preservation of democracy in mm -hmm. South Africa. So could you tell us a little bit more about who is involved in this movement, who are the organizations, and what is the discussion that you're having? Okay. Yeah, great question. Um, so, I think in the first place, the project of radical economic transformation was a, is a project of is a project of disruption, uh, and I think the project it's a project of disruption in the sense to to break historical patterns of ownership and control uh, by changing the procurement practices of government. So it's essentially a project of breaking the hold of what's called in South Africa white monopoly capital, a term that's very generic, breaking its hold on the economy by moving them aside, weakening those, weakening those sorts of corporations, and creating space for new kinds of black owning, black control companies. So that's, if you ask me anything new, that I think is the instinct. Does it start? It does start. Um, the fact that the black owned and controlled companies that are largely that largely benefit are happen to be linked to a coterie of people around Jacob Zuma, around the president, including his family. His son is an enormous beneficiary. Um, uh, where the intermediation has taken place through a, a family of Indian origin who moved to South Africa and naturalized in South Africans called the Guptas, uh, who qualify, as, qualify in terms of their naturalization as black South Africans. We can be very, very alarmed and, 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 and laugh at the, at the way in which it's played out, but one has to take it seriously that there has been very, very major disruption. In, in, in certain areas. Um, and I suppose the idea is that if, if the project was a given time to mature, it would create this new kind of economy. There's a huge pressure, which one could argue has uh, got to do with uh, uh, deals made between the president and, and Putin in Russia of uh, massive, ex massive uh, um, a nuclear deal. Uh, massive, massive, in a way that is completely unaffordable to the Zavian economy, and it would generate electricity which we couldn't possibly use. Uh, but there's a sense that those sorts of projects would engender massive new economic, require new economic enterprises, which would give birth to a new black, black, black industrial class that would own and control the economy and transform it. So that would be the, the, me the measure, I suppose. Um, so they're very interesting developments in South Africa. And I can talk a little bit personally in this regard. So, um, as Patrick mentioned, the institute that I run works on government. Uh, and for a long, long time, we're about as unsexy as you can possibly imagine. There's not a great tradition of public administration scholarship in South Africa. To the extent that there was, it was associated with the, with the, old, with the apartheid universities. Um, so public administration was historically was a discipline which arose in the service of the apartheid project. Um, so it um, it's it's, suffers from very low credibility. Within the African National Congress, within the, the broad anti-apartheid movement, generally very, very little, uh, very, very little history of thinking in public administration terms, thinking institutionally. There's a very, very strong, very proud, quite remarkable tradition of political, econom political economy within the ANC, but very little thinking around the concrete dynamics and the concrete uh, structures of, 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 of how government works, etc. So um, there was very little attention to our work. Um, so we, we started doing work, for example, on public procurement. We, we showed, for example, that in South Africa, government essentially works by outsourcing. Uh, massive, massive outsourcing of, of government functions. 
So the annual spend, per, annual spend of, uh, for goods and services in South Africa is about 500 billion. Essentially, government works by outsourcing its work to, to third party service providers, largely private companies. There was some interest in specialist circles, but, but, but not much interest. Then the purge happens at, in, in, at, at SARS, and there's a huge assault on public servants. Very, very little political response. I tried to get a, develop a, a legal aid fund for, for, for public servants to try and get people on the street. Zero, zero interest. Then the Minister of Finance was fired in December 2015, and people got a fright. Uh, and there started to be a little bit of mobilization. Within civil society organizations, for example, people that would you know, I have a chipkin, nice guy, but boy, that's kind of weird stuff. Uh, there was a growing interest. Today, we're in a quite different world. Um, there is quite a, a re-emergence of very, very active social movements in South Africa. Uh, caricatured in some parts as kind of, uh, as a kind of a liberal opposition. There's definitely been a reorganization within business, which has funded all sorts of social movements, uh, beginning to fund social movements. On the left as well, there are sort of more left social movements beginning to emerge, and we'll be able to put people, uh, people in the street. What I think is very, very encouraging, it goes back to, to Peter's question, um, and I think it's historically unprecedented in South Africa. You have embryonically a movement emerging which is standing up for public servants. And which is in which understands that going forward, building the state is a is a worthwhile and noble uh, challenge, and you have more and more organisations and social movements talking the language of solidarity with public servants, uh, talking about uh, depoliticising the administrations. Um, so that's very exciting to me. At the same time, we've got independent press. Uh, part, the courts in South Africa have, 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 have held up. Um, so these political networks which I've described are under tremendous political strain, and more strain than they've ever been under. I think it makes them incredibly brazen. It makes them very, very dangerous. But it's not, it's not obvious anymore that they're, they're winning. Uh, and how this plays itself out going forward, I don't know. It's very, very scary times in South Africa. Uh, for, personally, I feel a little bit, we'll see after December, last year, this year has been very tough. There was a open fire in my car, there were break-ins in the offices, um, the very high, s things are feeling a bit easier at the moment, but uh, but very, 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 very dynamic political environment, very, very exciting political environment. Scary, it's scary to be in South Africa at the moment. Patrick, and then, I, I want to push on, push on the political project mm. part, because I, it doesn't totally add up for me. So on the one hand, if you're using the state to be disruptive um, and privileging black firms at the expense of white firms, I would imagine you get a lot of capital. I mean, a lot of this is, you know, Glencore, these are all, you know, highly mobile forms of capital, right? And this is why Mbeki didn't do it in the first place, because there was this tremendous fear of, of, of white capital flight. So is that not happening? And second, you know, this, this disruptive vision, I mean, this is just creating a rentier class. I mean, it's not creating a black bourgeoisie. It's, it's creating a black, rent, rent, you know, non-dynamic. We're not going to get China out of this, no. right? Um, there doesn't seem to be any internal competition. As you said, it's a coterie of friends of the president, et cetera. And then the third part, because I agree um, that the South African state's been a lot more redistributive than it's been given credit for. Seekings and naturists have you know, all the numbers, and it's pretty. I, I think South Africa has the highest uh, post, um, post income tax transfer of any mid income country in the world, right? It's, it's quite astonishing. But isn't that becoming harder and harder to fund? I mean, if they're blowing $7 billion on some rentier deal with the Guptas, I mean, what, what, isn't that undermining revenues for? Um, the housing programs and, and service delivery. And then the, the third and final related question is, politically, it just seems to be failing. I mean, the, the service delivery protests that have been happening in South African cities are unending. I mean, I, it's yeah. just thousands a year, and they just keep on going. And then politically, for the first time ever, the ANC has lost elections. And by all accounts, 
Um, it lost in the uh, municipal elections, what was it, a year ago? And in the big, in Joburg, it lost Joburg, it lost... Um, Pretoria. Pretoria. Uh, and I lost one. And, it, and it, it, it lost the black middle class vote, which is now voting for the, well, we're not we sure. Know. We don't know. But, so it's lots of black middle class vote. The, the urban poor are pissed off and, and protesting. The political project is generating a lot of rents and a lot of controversy. I mean, this sounds like a really failed political project. Or am I missing something? I, no, I think you've described it really, really well. So yes, <laughs> the day before yesterday was the, so the real thorn in the side was the Minister of Finance, Pravin Gordon. Um, so in May this year, uh, he's fired decisively, and the engineer of radical economic transformation, Malusi Gigaba, is brought in as the Minister of Finance, promising all a new kind of economic policy. So he gave his budget speech yesterday, day before yesterday, completely conventional. He described, he said he needed to be clean and be transparent about the state of the economy, etc. The economy, we're in such dire, it's such dire straits. There's a sense that the project is in collapse. Economically, it's in collapse. We're, they've revised our growth, our growth prospects from below one percent to 0.7 percent. Uh, you know, this is this is unsustainable. Our, our population growth is much higher than that. Um, there is now the last budget. There was a 0.3 billion uh, gap between the budget and, and what was collected in taxes. This year, there's 50 billion gap. 50 billion. So there's just a whole lot of things that are just not, not affordable anymore. So the project is definitely coming apart. It's definitely coming apart. Um, the political consequences, well, this is where things are, where are, are, are so unstable. And this is why to think of this as just as a coterie of people involved in, in theft, it becomes impossible to sustain this. And yet, the networks are sustainable at certain levels. Yes, they're under huge... Con Huge, huge pressure. But the point is, the Jacob Zuma, this coterie of people, he's able to bring out majorities in the ANC itself almost every time. Uh, so the opposition within the ANC is growing, there's no doubt about it. There was a no confidence vote in his presidency earlier this year, and he got an overwhelming majority, but a, a good 35 to 40 MPs voted with the opposition in favor of the no confidence vote. So that says something. But it's still a tiny minority. I think that there is a strong conviction, and I don't think it's an ideology. I think we have to distinguish between a conviction and an ideology here. The conviction is this, that you need to let the economy break. If we're going to, and, and a new kind of economy will emerge. It's a bit like Zimbabwe, you know, where you need to, that the more things break is, more, is, is a sign of, it's, almost, it's progressive. That there's this kind of idea of a phoenix rising from the ashes of kind of a transformed economy. Not just that it breaks, it's broken. There's a sense that breaking is in and of itself, it's, it, it, it's, it's progressive. So I think from a, from a patronist point of view, it's, 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 it's unsustainable. As a political project, it's unsustainable. But in the end, where we go is dependent on the electoral fortune of the ANC. So my reading, there's a big uh, national congress in December for the election of a new leader of the ANC. There's massive contestation going on. Uh, Jacob Zuma is unable to uh, run again. So he's got, he's got his wife running uh, with a campaign in support of his, his ex-wife, um, which is running very much in, in, on the lines of, of a project of radical economic transformation. Uh, my reading is that uh, she can't, if, they, if she wins December, which is a possibility, uh, the ANC can't win 2019 as an election. Um, I've been watching electro ANC's electoral fortunes since since Paul since 2009, and it's quite unambiguous that there is a gradual, uneven decline of the ANC across the country, between 8 to 10% of, across the country. What has kept the ANC majorities fairly high, though, is, is what's uh, bucked the trend, is uh, a province called KwaZulu-Natal. So whereas ANC support has been declining everywhere in, across the country, in KwaZulu-Natal, they've seen a quite meteoric rise. They've displaced, they've basically, uh, opposition has collapsed in, in that province, and the ANC has taken up all those votes. So it's offset the declines across the, across the country, in the other parts of the country. But the KZN story is finished. They've, they've definitely reached the maximum they could ever reach in KZN, and their support is beginning to decline. 
So I put the ANC vote at about 45% if, 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 um, if uh, Nkosazan and Zuma wins. And then the question is, well, then do we survive as a democracy? Will they go for, will they try and rig the election? And that's pretty much where the debate is in South Africa. So taking off from that, that last yeah. point you made, so at least the way it looks right now, um, let's say it's not ANC in the future, 2019. We have an option right now, someone like Julius Malema from the EFF, someone like Musa Maimani from the DA. Um, how much of a difference could they make? Where would you, like, I have a fear a little bit about the things you're describing. It sounds like this kind of uh, zoomification, this kind of uh, institutional erosion uh, coming about through Jacob Zuma almost laid the groundwork for something like EFF to come about, at least in their discourse, in the way I've heard it. It sounds like it's, it's in line with a lot of the things you're describing, the idea of, of breaking the economy or, of, okay. you know, even more radical transformation. And I don't know what, what your take on it is that, what you, what you would see, more specifically I'm interested in Mount Lemma. What would you see from Mount Lemma, and what would you expect to see in regards to the kind of uh, institutional erosion that you're talking about right now? If he was to, let's say, um, become president, something to that extent. Look, quite frankly, I mean, I think the EFF is, he's like, uh, sort of, a, what do they describe themselves as a kind of Fanonian Marxist-Leninist party? Um, <laughs> so, uh, there are all sorts of intellectual attempts to reconcile Marxism and Leninism with Fanon, which I think have some intellectual uh, uh, value to them. Um, I think it's a, it's a small party. It's never going to be a big party. I mean, the idea uh, of Jacob, uh, Julius Malema as president of winning an election, I think, is completely far-fetched. My sense is that it's a party that will hit 8, eight to 10 percent of the vote. So, you know, and, and I'll tell you why, that's not just a hunch. If you look at the ANC's electoral support, it's something very interesting. So, the Tabo Mbeki days, and what's Tabo Mbeki? Tabo Mbeki is the kind of, uh, if you like, is the kind of uh, neoliberalism, the reform of the economy. There's fairly high economic growth. On, it has these pathological features. But it's also, it's also the ANC and in South Africa as the vanguard of an African modernity. Uh, Af South Africa is a major industrial power, black, uh, black, black country, major industrial power, a huge presence on the African continent, a renaissance on the African continent in the, in the direction of democracy, industrialization, urbanization, and of course a major player in, in the world. I mean, I think this vision, so this vision is compelling, um, not just amongst a small country, Thabo Mbeki's electoral results are just, uh, they're off the charts. You know, he gets, uh, he's getting majorities which are just unprecedented. He gets, uh, he, in the, in the, before Polokwane, he gets 67% of the vote. You know, they can rewrite that constitution tomorrow morning if they want to. He's got, easily got a two-thirds of the vote. I think that politics is hugely popular, and I think that's that idea of modernity, of a kind of a black African modernity which he represents, is enormously popular. Polokwane is associated with this, this populism, is associated with the beginning of the decline of the ANC electorally. And it's not just the black middle classes that are uneven the ANC, it's uneven. So some of the most precipitous, dramatic declines of the ANC are in rural areas. Northwest, solid, within, within the ANC's own politics, solidly in, within the Zuma camp. But in the 2016 local government election, uh, largely rural province, there's a 15% decline in its, in its electoral support. I mean, that's a dramatic decline. Um, so I think this kind of, 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 of populism is not, is not popular with the ANC. The idea of it going to the EFF, I am deeply skeptical. I have another scenario which I'm in, involved in and I'd be, I'd be very, very happy if, if, it, if it came about. And that would be that the ANC splits in 2015, 20, now 2017, that a kind of social democratic rump leaves, forms a new party, and that the, and the DA opposition merges into this new party, and you have a basis of a kind of left centrist social democratic party emerging in South Africa, which could maybe win an election. But that's my, my fantasy. So, yes. So, I'm not sure which question to ask. A lot of some fascinating stuff, uh, troubling but fascinating stuff. I mean, I guess one question I have is about, uh, again, probing this relationship between the political project and the corruption and, 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 and the relationship between what you might call kind of political moral discourses and real political economic interests and the ways in which they can align and not align. It seems like to me like part of your story here, but also part of the story that we're seeing in other comparative other parts of the world that you're comparing to is that they can misalign. Right? That, that, that people can tell themselves, elites can tell themselves these stories, people can tell themselves these political moral stories that don't actually align with political economic interests. Right. So 
maybe just a little more on that as part one. But then the other one is, is to ask, and this is more, maybe a more concrete question, to ask you to say something more about race and class, and, and particularly the question as to whether this disruptive radical economic transformation project is a, is a project that can continue to, to appeal only to the extent that it's addressing the question of racial inequality. And then as it becomes clear that the real problem, or another real problem, not the real problem, another real problem is class inequality, it becomes unsustainable. Yeah, it's a marvelous question. Um, can I answer it by stepping back a kind of historical? <laughs> so historically, there's a, within the ANC, in ANC in particular, there is a very long history of, of, of debating this, this kind of race and class relationship. Um, it produces an analysis from the late 60s and early 70s, informed by the South American models of articulation of modes of production. Uh, which produces a particular understanding of how apartheid works as, as in its relation to capitalism. Within the ANC, though, what is, what is debated uh, vigorously uh, and has leads to some quite moments of quite profound crisis in the ANC is to who is the leading, what are called in the ANC's language, the motor forces of the revolution. Who are the, who's the, who are the vanguard of the, of the revolution? Now, through this one particular reading of the political economy of the apartheid as a system of capitalism, the sense is that the revolution must be led by the working class. Um, um, that they, that the, what's called the National Democratic Revolution, th that its leadership falls to the working class to lead. Um, that the working class will both liberate themselves from exploitation, but in liberating themselves from exploitation, they will also liberate blacks from, from racial domination. And the analysis is informed by the way in which race domination and class exploitation work in South Africa as working hand in glove. So if you liberate the working class from class exploitation, you will simultaneously liberate blacks from, from, from national, national oppression. So that is the argument which wins out at, the, at a very famous, incredibly uh, heavily contested uh, national congress in, 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 in Morogoro in Tanzania in 1969. But that conception is heavily contested right along. And by the mid-1980s, that understanding that the leadership of the anti-apartheid struggle must fall to the working class, which is why, by the way, the ANC is always in, is in coalition, in partnership with the Communist Party and with trade unions, is informed by that, by that analysis. By 1985, at the Kabwe Conference, which was in Zambia, that conception of working class leadership has been heavily, heavily diluted. And instead, there's a formulation which emerges, which is very, very tricky politically. And the argument is that the leadership of the anti-apartheid struggle must fall to blacks in general and Africans in particular. So there's a growing racial conception of the leadership of the anti-apartheid struggle. So if, if the working class is a sociological concept, who are blacks in general? Who are, who, who, who are Africans? And what you start seeing under Tabo Mbeki after liberation is that Africans in particular refers to the emergence of a black, black bourgeoisie that essentially the vanguard of transformation and liberation in South Africa will not, be, will not be the working class, but will essentially be the emergence of a black capitalist class. And that is one of the great theoretical and political innovations of, 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 of Thabo Mbeki in, 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 in the 1990s and early 2000s. And it's that tradition which I think is now taken up very, very aggressively within, within Jacob Zuma's administration, and in particular within the reading of radical economic transformation, that the way to transform South Africa socially, that leadership must pass to, to, to a black bourgeoisie, and in particular, a, 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 an, industrial, an, an industrial bourgeoisie. So that's a long but way. But ultimately, out. do you think that that, I mean, is that as, I mean, going back to Patrick's, it seems like a failed political project, or a likely to fail political project. I mean, it's, given that the interest of the overwhelming majority of blacks in South Africa is not a bourgeoisie interest. No. You see, you, it's complicated by the fact, I mean, there's an, old, there's, an old, there's an old Leninist tradition in South Africa, which is very deeply ingrained, I think it's deeply ingrained in all, sort of na in all national liberation movements, which conflate the party with the people. And what it makes it very difficult to continent okay. is the idea of electoral loss. Because there's a sense, therefore, that if the ANC is weakened, or even if it loses electorally, the people itself have been displaced from power. So even though the project is in fundamental crisis, there's no doubt about it. The idea that that translates into an, a, a political loss for the, for, for the ANC is almost impossible for, for, for many in the ANC to come to terms with. And this is why it informs the kind of a sense that the project is collapsing, but tremendous nonetheless rallying behind, behind the ANC as a vehicle. Yeah. And that's why I think 
how we proceed as a democracy is, a, is an open question. I think we're going to win it, but why? Uh, I don't know. In which case, uh, my CV is in circulation. <laughs> <laughs> Ivor, uh, the, the fact that Ari does the work that you do mm -hmm. does, I think, say something uh, quite important about uh, the, the depth of democracy in South Africa, mm -hmm. the crisis notwithstanding, because I think the critiques we've heard today are compelling and powerful, and they are part of this public conversation, yeah. which in itself is quite extraordinary. We could think of other cases across the world where I suspect Ari would be out of business by now. So uh, if nothing else, at least that's uh, some room for optimism. So uh, I just want to thank you for the time you've taken. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. And thank everyone for their questions. It was a really terrific dialogue. So thank you. Thank you.